Hi there, College Algebra folks, back with another uh, uh, video here where I'm going to work through a couple of examples with you over, uh, in this case, 5.1 material. Hopefully you have checked out the notes on Blackboard. Uh, we are changing gears into Chapter 5, uh, where uh, Chapter 5 is going to introduce us to our last two classes of functions. Uh, as I had noted at the beginning of the semester, our uh, a big portion of our study this semester is on what we call functional behavior and understanding that there are lots of different types of functional behavior and we've been introduced to uh, most of those different types, right? In our study of linear functions, in our study of the library of functions, in our study of uh, quadratic functions and, and, and polynomial functions and rational functions. We've been studying these different types of functions. And what chapter five introduces us to is the last two classes of functions that we're gonna study here in college algebra. Uh, there are more to come if you go on to take trigonometry, but here in college algebra, the last two we're gonna look at are what are known as the exponential and the logarithmic functions. Um, so chapter five is gonna introduce us to those function types. Um, in order to introduce exponential and logarithmic functions though, uh, we need to introduce a uh, property that some functions have, or we need to introduce a, a generic class type for functions uh, known as uh, inverse functions. And that's what section 5.1 gets into. It, it starts to introduce us to this idea of being an inverse function to another given function. And one of the first conditions that must be true uh, for a function in order to have this property where this inverse function exists is that the function needs to be what we call one-to-one -one in value. So you'll see your first question type here uh, over this material does look at a couple of functions where we're being asked, are these functions here? 16 minus x squared or the function 2x minus 5, what we call one-to-one -one functions. Now, if you go back into the notes, what it means to be one-to-one -one is that for each independent variable, there corresponds just one dependent value. And for each dependent value, does there correspond just one independent value to that variable? All right? If so, we have what's called a one-to-one -one function. All right? If not, then the function is said not to be one-to-one, -one. all right? Now, there are a couple of ways of determining if this is the case for a given function, right? One of those ways is by looking at a table of values, right? To begin with, if we consider in this first case, looking at this table of values for this function 16 minus x squared, we might consider, well, if I input a value of x equal to zero, right, the output of this function does equal the value of 16, right? Meaning that there is this one-to-one -one relationship, well, I should say this, for this one independent value, there corresponds just one dependent value, 16, right? However, if we look at another value, well, where if we continue to add to this table, we might look at a value like 1. If we input 1, we would see that this would produce 16 minus 1 squared, which would be 15 in value. If I was to look at a value like 2, plugging in 2 would lead me to 16 minus 4, which would be 12 in value and so forth, right? Uh, certainly as, as x increases here, we see that there just corresponds one value of f of x. In a one-to-one -one relationship though, for each of these independent, or I should say, be careful there, for each of these dependent values, there must also just correspond one independent value in order to be what we call one-to-one -one in relationship. One of these for one of these and one of these for one of these. 
Now notice for zero and 16, if we put in 16, we do get back zero or uh, f of x equal to 16. Whereas if I was to think about f of x being 16 in value and solving that for x, we do find that negative x squared would equal zero or x squared would equal zero or x would simply be zero itself. And for that one value of 16, there is just one independent value for the variable of x. However, that has to be true for every single value of f of x. If I was to look at, for instance, f of x equal to 15, and consider 15 minus, oh well, equal to 16 minus x squared, and consider solving for the values of x that cause that value of 15 for the dependent value of our function, subtracting 16 from each side would leave me with negative one on the left equal to negative x squared, Dividing by negative one on both sides would say that one equals x squared. And then taking the square root of both sides would tell me that x would equal plus or minus the square root of one, which is itself the value of one. What I've just illustrated here is if I think about having a table that looks like it takes as input f of x and gives back some value of x, 15 actually corresponds back to two different values of x, right? This one dependent value of 15 actually corresponds to more than one independent value, right? We could have seen that over here in the table if we had chose negative 1 also. Uh, negative 1 plugged in here is negative 1 squared is positive 1 and 15, or 16 minus positive one is 15 in value. And we would have seen 15 as the result two times in this table, All right? What this is highlighting here is that this function is not one to one. For each independent value, there may correspond just one dependent value. Now that's what makes it functional. But in order to be one to one, that means also that for each dependent value, there must correspond just one independent value where if we look at that relationship given in this table here for just the number 15, from the beginning it is obvious that that is not true. This one dependent value of 15 actually corresponds back to two independent values, negative one and positive one in value, All right? The easiest way, however, to go about determining if a function is one to one is actually to look at the graph of a function, all right? If I was to look at the graph of 16 minus x squared, that graph is, is really no mystery to us. We should be familiar with what that graph looks like, right? That is just the square function, right? x squared, vertically reflected around the x-axis and shifted up 16 units. So along our y-axis, it would have a y-intercept up here at 16, and it would be this parabolic shape that would be opening down in value, right? This would be the sketch of our function 16 minus x squared. And what we note is that a function First of all, we'll have to pass the vertical line test, which this function does. This function does pass the vertical line test. But in order to be a one-to-one -one function, the function also has to pass what's known as the horizontal line test, which is very similar to the vertical. Every horizontal line drawn through the graph of a one-to-one -one function will intersect that function in just one location. And what we see here for 16 minus x squared is if I draw a couple of horizontal lines through that graph, most of those horizontal lines will intersect at more than one location. There is just one horizontal line where that's not true, right? That would be the horizontal line passing through where y equals 16, right? For most of them though, uh, 
we can say that it fails the HLT. It may pass the VLT, the vertical line test, which tells us that it's functional, but it does fail the, the horizontal line test, which tells us it's not what we summarize as being one-to-one -one in value. All right? If we use that here in our second case for case B, we could look at this graphically pretty quickly. This is the graph of a line with a y-intercept of negative 5 and a slope of 2. And if I was to sketch that line, right, y-intercept of negative 5, there's my y-intercept. Slope of 2 means I run, uh, rise 2 and run 1. That would put this point on my graph. And my graph being a line would look just like this here, right? Where we can see that it passes the vertical line test, right? Which tells us it is functional. And if we come back and we look at the horizontal line test, we can also note it passes the horizontal line test. Right? So it is what we say is one-to-one -one in its behavior. Which does mean if I made a table of x and f of x values, right? For each value of x I substitute into this function. For instance, if I put in the value of 1, I would see that this function would give me negative 3. 2 times 1 is 2, minus 5 is negative 3. Whereas if I come back and think about making f of x negative 3 and the corresponding value of x, if I consider solving this equation for setting it equal to negative 3, I will get back just one value for x. Notice you would subtract, or sorry, add 5 to both sides. You get 2x equals 2, you divide by 2, and you'd end up with just x equaling 1 in value. Just this one value of x as a solution. This happens for every single coordinate. This is what we call 1 to 1 in its relationship. For each value of x, there's one value of y, and for each value of y, there corresponds just one value of x. This is illustrating 1 to 1 behavior, folks. Right? So this is our first cases of, a, uh, well, first example of, of problem types that we sometimes look at um, working with in uh, the study of inverse functions. And this is all setting up a condition to have an inverse. In order for a function to have an inverse, it has to be defined as a one-to-one -one function over its domain. Right? Um, it has to have this property that for each independent variable, there's one dependent. And for each dependent, there is exactly one independent value. All right? So um, the quickest way of telling that is the horizontal line test. Um, with that said, folks, I'll be back in a, a short moment here just to work through a, a second set of examples with you. See you then. Hey there, College Algebra folks, back here with more examples from Section 5.1 material uh, where we are studying the inverse of a function. And uh, the next question type we see here involves um, verifying or determining if two functions are the inverses of each other. And what this re does rely on, folks, is our understanding of what it means to be um, a set of inverse functions or what it means for one function to have an inverse of another and what that inverse function is, right? And, and, and if we uh, keep in mind that understanding, what we have there is the idea that what are inverse functions of one another are two functions whose um, arithmetic, whose mathematics, whose algebra uh, undoes one another, right? Uh, and the way that we check or the way that we verify that two functions algebra undoes one another's algebra is we compose those functions with one another, right? 
two functions are inverses of each other, if when composed with one another, the composition yields the result of simply the value of x. All right, all this being presented back there in those blackboard notes. So go back and check that out, folks. Uh, but let's put that to practice here. We might look at case A where we have these two functions, right? And we want to verify that these are inverses of each other. We want to show that these are inverses of each other, right? If inverses, if inverses, we might say f composed with g at x should equal the value of x and g composed with f at x should equal the value of x. We are going to have to go back and rely on the idea of composition here, right? If these are inverses of each other, then f composed with g at x would equal x and g composed with f at x would equal x. They would undo each other's algebra in their composition. If we consider in this first case, f composed with g at x, keep in mind that is taking function f and making its independent value g of x. g of x being this function here, f of x being this function here. And what this notation is telling us to do is to replace this x in the notation for f with this function g of x. If we wanna interpret that, we might think of this as being a function f evaluated at one half times the quantity x minus five cubed. Which means to go into this function here and where we see this value of x inside that function to replace it with this entire quantity here. Where if I do that, that will end up equaling Right? We do have the 5 plus the cube root of 2 times this quantity, where this quantity x is this quantity represented in the parentheses here that's going to get entirely replaced with this quantity 1 half times x minus 5 cubed. Now to begin, what we want to do is simplify this statement and see what we simplify to. And as we start to simplify, one of the first things we'll do is we'll multiply 2 times this quantity inside the parentheses here that replace the value of x. And we'll see first off that 2 times 1 half is just the value of 1. So one step in, we might say we have 5 plus the cube root of, and then these kind of canceling with each other, the quantity x minus 5 cubed. Whereas we simplify in the next step, we might notice the cube root is going to cancel with this quantity cubed. Taking this quantity and cubing it, and then taking its cube root, the cubing and the cube root are going to cancel with each other, and you're going to be left with 5 plus x minus 5. Where here in the last step, we can see that 5 plus x minus 5, the 5s will end up canceling with each other. And in the end, it will equal the value of x. And what we've just shown here is that f composed with g at x equals the result of x. Right? That is implying that we have a high likelihood that these two functions are inverses of each other. We should technically go back and look at the composition in the other order. And if we do that, let's come back and consider doing that. Right? If we consider g composed with f at x in the exact same example, that is plugging into g function f of x. That is taking this entire function f of x and making it this input inside of g. This is evaluating g at 5 plus the cube root of 2 times x. Right? This being our statement for f of x, given above, right? where we want to take g now and make its input this quantity. So if I go into g and make that input there x, that quantity, this will yield 1 half times the quantity 5 plus the cube root of 2x right? minus 5 
quantity cubed. Where I now start to simplify that statement. Beginning inside the parentheses, I do notice that I have this 5 minus 5, and those two values of 5 will begin by canceling. You will be left with 1 half times the quantity given by the cube root of 2x cubed, where the cube root and the cube will cancel, and you'll be left with 1 half times 2x where 1 half times 2x, we will see the 2 cancel with the 1 half, leaving us in the end with the value of x. g composed with f at x equals x, right? So since f composed with g at x and g composed with f at x both equal x, f and g are inverses, right? They are inverses of each other, folks. They are, in a sense, two functions. If we go back up here to these two functions, these are two functions that undo each other's arithmetic, right? This function, the x is being multiplied by 2 and then taking its cube root and adding 5 to the, all that, whereas this function undoes that. It takes its x subtracts 5, takes its cube value, and divides that all by 2. Notice dividing by 2 is an opposite of multiplying by 2. Raising an argument to the third power is the opposite of taking an argument's cube root. And subtracting 5 is the opposite of adding 5. Right? We do see these inverse operations happening between these two functions, which is indicative of inverse behavior. What you will notice, though, is that those inverse operations happen in a reverse order to the value of x. Right? Notice the first thing we do here is multiply by 2, then take the cube root, and then add 5. Whereas the first thing we would do here to x is subtract 5, take its cube, and then divide by 2 which sort of reverses the operation order that we saw back here in the case for f. All right, let's consider our second example. All right, if we look at our second example here, we're gonna look at f composed with g at x. This is gonna be function f, where I'm gonna put inside of it its independent value, make it g of x. That is gonna be finding f at the quantity 4 over x plus 10. All right, that's going to go in here for x and replace it with this quantity here. All right, if I do that, I will get 4 over the quantity 4 over x plus 10 minus 10. We're down here in this denominator. You'll notice, first of all, you really don't need the parentheses. You could really think of this as 4 just over 4 over x plus 10 minus 10, where these 10s will cancel. And you're left with 4 over 4 divided by x. Now dividing by a fraction is the same as multiplying by its reciprocal. So divide or multiplying by the reciprocal of the, the denominator here. So if we multiply by the reciprocal of 4 over x, that's multiplying by x over 4 we will see these fours in the numerator and denominator canceling, leaving us with just the value of x. In this case, we see f composed with g at x does give us back the value of x. All right? It appears that these two functions, arithmetic, is undoing each other in their composition. Let's look at another order, though, of that arrangement. Certainly, we have to see that happen in both cases. Uh, if we consider g composed with f at x, that is substituting into g function f of x. That is taking this function here and putting it into this denominator here found in g. That is taking g and evaluating it at 4 over x minus 10. All right? So if we plug that in here to this denominator, that would be 4 over 4 over x minus 10, 
plus 10. And now we've got to start cleaning this up. Like we did in the previous example at the end, dividing by this fraction is the same as multiplying by its reciprocal. So if we multiply the 4 in the numerator by its reciprocal, we will see the 4's cancel. And we'll be left with x minus 10 plus 10, where we will see those 10's cancel, and in the end be left again with x. All right? So since f composed with g at x equals x, and g composed with f at x equals x in this case, we must know that these two functions, f and g, must be the inverses of each other. All right? So this is another problem type here, folks, where we are looking at given two functions, determining if they're the inverses of each other, or what we might call verifying inverses, which relies on what it means to be an inverse. And what it means to be an inverse, in a sense, is that you're a function that, when composed with its inverse, uh, undoes each other's arithmetic, right? And in the end, leaves you with just your independent value of x, all right? So folks, that's my uh, second example in this study of 5.1 material where we're just going through verifying inverses and kind of understanding what it means to be an inverse. Uh, we got a couple more example types to come back to and we'll see those in just a moment. Hey there, College Algebra folks, back with another couple of quick examples here in our study of inverse functions. Where here in these two examples, we are given uh, the case of some one-to-one -one functions, and we're asked to graph, or well, not graph, but to find, determine, or find the inverse of the following functions. And if you've gone through the Blackboard notes, there is a process for that. And if we start here in the first case, for f of x equal to 6 minus 1 fourth x, all right, that process begins by rewriting or, or replacing the f of x in this function with the variable y. And express this equation as y equals 6 minus 1 fourth x. All right, I do follow that up with, in the steps, just swapping the locations of variables x and y inside the equation. Where I see the y, I make that into x. And where I see the x, I make that into the value of y. And then the third step in the process, which we're going to do to this equation here, is we are going to solve for the value of y. Now this is often the trickiest step in the process. Here in this linear equation, it's not too bad, but we might see in this case or in some other cases, it could get a little tricky. But it's following your rules of algebra where you have to isolate this variable y. So the first thing we do is subtract 6 from both sides. We get x minus 6 equals negative 1 fourth y. And then we multiply both sides by negative 4 to begin isolating the y, right? If I multiply the left hand or right hand side by negative 4, we will get y all by itself on the right. And if I multiply the left by negative 4, I will have negative 4 times the quantity x minus 6. Distributing that negative 4 then leaves us with y equals, and I'm, I'm going to rearrange our terms here, move the y to the left, move these to the right, negative 4x plus 24, all right? Just reordering the two sides of the equation, right? Swapping their sides, I build this equation here. Now here I have solved for y, where then the final step in the finding the inverse process involves replacing this y with our inverse notation. Remember the notation we instituted or or take note of in those blackboard notes is that if this is my function f its inverse is denoted as f with this superscript negative one in uh, on that function 
It looks a little like a power up there, but that really is just what we call inverse notation. It's saying I am the inverse of function f here. And what becomes the inverse of function f is what we have here on the right hand side, negative 4x plus 24. This here is my inverse function. This here is the inverse of the function given above. And I could check that by composing them, right? If I composed f with g at x, that would be plugging this into this. This would be 6 minus a fourth times negative 4x plus 24. When I distribute the negative 1 fourth, this will become 6 plus x minus 6. The 6's will cancel and I'll be left with the value of x. That is certainly a way to begin checking our inverse function here, is compose them with one another. Here I really should have composed, maybe I should have said f with f. Inverse. All right. um, we would see a similar result in the uh, substituting this f into here for x. It will give us the same result you would do. But that is finding the inverse function. It is those basic steps. Start with your function that you're given. Replace the f of x with y. Interchange the x and y. Swap them out in the equation. Replace one with the other. And then solve for y. Now that does require a little algebra to solve for y, where once you have it solved for y, right, because that, here's our solution for y, you just replace that y with your function notation here, folks. All right? This y is just being replaced by function notation and yielding my inverse function. Let's look at this example real quick. If we look at the case for b here, f of x equal to the value 3 times the fifth root of 4x minus 2. If f of x equals 3 times the fifth root of 4x minus 2, recall the first step in this process is we replace the f of x with y. Right? So we end up building this equation. We then swap x and y's values. We say x must be then equal to 3 times the fifth root of 4y minus 2. And then once I have this equation here, I solve for the value of y. Solving for y will require me to divide both sides by 3 to begin with. Right? You will get x divided by 3 must be the fifth root of 4y minus 2. To undo the fifth root, we're going to raise that all to a power of 5. The roots will cancel, and you will be left with x over 3 raised to the fifth power on the left-hand side, all equal to 4y minus 2 on the right. We would then add 2 to both sides, right? Add 2 here, add 2 here. These 2's cancel, and you're left with x divided by 3 raised to the fifth power plus 2 must equal 4y. And then to finish it all off, we're going to multiply both sides by 1 fourth, or divide everything by 4. All right? On the right, you will get the value y. On the left, you will have this 1 fourth that needs to distribute. 1 fourth times this factor would be 1 fourth times the quantity x divided by 3 raised to the fifth power, plus 1 fourth times 2 simplifies to 1 half. Now I've solved this equation for y. I could rearrange it so it looks like this statement here, where to explicitly state that as a inverse function, I just re now replace the y with my inverse notation, which says this is equal to 1 fourth times the quantity x divided by 3 raised to the fifth power plus 1 half in value. Right? That becomes my inverse 
function. And technically, when composed with each other, they should undo each other's algebra, right? If I go back and I illustrate that composition again real quick, right, that verification here, that check step, we might replace this x with this result, right? Here, let me just go ahead and bring f inverse over here. Here we had f inverse was equal to 1 fourth times the quantity x divided by 3 to the fifth plus 1 half. So I'm going to put this whole quantity in here for x. All right? f composed with its inverse at x, right? It's just replacing this x with this entire quantity, all right? It would be three times the fifth root of four times one fourth times the quantity x divided by three raised to the fifth power plus one half, all right? All minus the value of two. And if I start inside the radical, distributing the four, to the first term and to the second term here. When the four is distributed to the first term, it will cancel with that fourth and leave you with three times the fifth root of x over three to the fifth power. All right? When it distributes to the plus one half here, four times a half is plus two and then we would have this minus 2. Now you can see plus 2 minus 2 underneath that radical will cancel. And you'll be left with 3 times the fifth root of x divided by 3 raised to the fifth power. The fifth root and the fifth power will cancel, leaving you with 3 times x divided by 3. And then the 3 in the numerator will cancel with that 3 in the denominator, leaving us just with the value of x. Right? So what we've just done there is checked our inverse, right? These two functions are certainly the inverses of each other. When we compose them with each other, we do have them undo each other's arithmetic, right? So that is finding inverses, folks. Uh, same process was used in each problem here, right? It does begin by taking your function and replacing the f of x with y, swapping x and y's values, and then solving that result for y. Once you solve it for y, which is typically the, the trickiest of the steps, you then just replace this y with the inverse notation, giving you the inverse of your function. All right? So again, folks, that was a couple of quick examples over finding or determining the inverse. I'll be back with, I think, one more example here, looking at the graphs of inverse and inverse functions and their relationships. All right? So we'll see you all in just a moment. All right, college algebra folks, our last example here in uh, the study of inverse functions is uh, related to the graphs of inverses, right? And here we have the graph of a function given to us. My printer's a little low on ink, apparently. All right, so it's making that graph a bit multicolored there, so I'll fill that in. Um, but what we do have here, right, is the graph we can see of a one-to-one -one function. It passes the vertical line test, meaning it's a function, and it passes the horizontal line test, indicating it's a one-to-one -one function. And it terminates at these endpoints, and it does have this little uh, crook in it right there, right at the uh, corner of four and negative four in value, right, this location right there, all right? This is our graph of f. What we wanna do here is sketch the graph of what we call f inverse. And what we are told back in the notes that are presented up on Blackboard is that if a comma b, right? If a comma b is a point on f, then what is true is b comma a is a point on f's inverse, 
right? This is that relationship between uh, function f and function, function f inverse. They are functions that undo each other, right? They are functions that move a to b and then b back to a, right, in their relationship. f makes a into b, whereas f inverse makes b back into a, all right? In terms of their graphs, what we are told about their graphs is that their graphs not only behave th with this coordinate behavior, right, but they are also what we say are symmetric to this diagonal line we call y equal x, right? This relationship between the coordinates where a comma b is on the graph of f and b comma a is on the graph of f inverse, this relationship between those coordinates causes a symmetry that occurs across this line y equal to x. Now, to actually sketch out our inverse, we are going to illustrate that symmetry as well as exploit this fact about our coordinates. For instance, I know down here this coordinate is located at 4, negative 4. 4 units on the x-axis, negative 4 units on the y-axis. So that means on the graph of my inverse, right, 4, negative 4 will lead me to the coordinate negative 4, comma 4. If this is on the graph of f, this is going to be a coordinate on the graph of f's inverse. All right. Well, where is negative 4, 4? That's this coordinate right here. Similarly, I have this coordinate up here that's located at 7, 8 on the graph of f. So what I would expect on the inverse is the coordinate 8, 7, right? That coordinate given by this location right here. Right? And how the line would behave, or how the graph of f inverse would behave between these two points would be as the graph of f illustrates, and that is a linear behavior, where that linear behavior happening here is symmetrical to this linear behavior happening here across this line y equal to x. All right? This would be the coordinate uh, negative 4, comma 4, this is our coordinate 7, 8, so we see this coordinate 8, 7. And then likewise, we have this coordinate down here, which is located at negative 8, 7. Sorry, negative 8, negative 7. Negative 8 on the x-axis, negative 7 on the y-axis. So we would expect to see the coordinate negative 7, comma negative 8 on the graph of f inverse. Well, negative 7 comma 8 is this coordinate right here. All right? This is negative 8 comma negative 7. This is the coordinate negative 7 comma negative 8. Where what I would expect to have illustrated here is behavior that is symmetrical to this line, and it should illustrate linear behavior. So if I connect the dots here, right? best I can with a straight line, I illustrate that as by graph, right? So here would be the graph of f inverse, right? This is the graph of f inverse compared to this graph here, which is the graph of f. They are both symmetrical across this line, y equal to x running through the center of this graph. They are a mirror image of, of each other across that line. Right? This is the relationship that we see between the coordinates right, in the graph of the inverse function when compared to the graph of f. This is what means to be inverse relationships to one another. They are uh, a relationship that takes the x-coordinate and makes it the y-coordinate in the inverse and takes the y-coordinate and makes it the x-coordinate in the inverse. Right? They are... Um, functions that behave with this specific relationship, all right? So that is the last example we have kind of in there in our uh, study of inverse functions that I'm going to work through with you. Um, again, if you have any other questions, you can always catch me on the Blackboard Collaborate um, 
sessions where I, I hold 12 of those a week, folks. Um, morning, noon, and night, right? Uh, Monday through Thursday. So you're always welcome to check in at any one of those times uh, if you happen to have any questions. I will tell you my Calc students are a, a little bit more active, uh, but I always have a little bit of free time uh, in those classes. If you had a quick question or two, I could certainly uh, give you some time. And even sometimes they, they're inactive at they only show up for a little bit at the beginning of class, and I certainly would have a lot of time after if they had any specific questions. So I'm on there for those hours. Make sure you check them out. If you have any questions, uh, please come see me. Um, I'll follow this up with some more example videos over, um, well, continuing into Chapter 5. 5.2, uh, 5.3, five, 5.4, five, five, and 5.5 five, five is my plan, folks. So you'll see those come out over the next couple of days. Hope all this is helping. I hope you're hanging in there. Uh, and I will see you soon. Catch you then. Later.